Welcome everybody. We are here today for the launch of University UK International's latest report, five little known facts about international student mobility to the UK. I'm Eleanor Jubb, I'm policy manager at University UK working on immigration and I'll let Janet introduce herself. Hello, I'm Janet Ilyeva, I'm a researcher in international higher education. So this report is part of the work which Universities UK and Universities UK International have been doing on immigration for some time now, ensuring that staff and students from all over the world can come to UK universities is a really big priority for us. And that's because we know that international staff and students are invaluable to UK universities, but not just to them, also to the local communities where they are and to the UK as a whole. Focusing just on international students as the main focus of this report, we know that from independent research, international students provide a £25.8 billion boost each year to the UK economy, and that creates £13.8 billion in GDP each year, as well as also supporting £3.3 million in tax revenue and 206,000 jobs. Another piece of research earlier this year showed that wasn't just in London or the UK's big cities, that's all over the country in every single constituency. And their fees also provide a cross subsidy which help UK universities to support activity which otherwise wouldn't be financially sustainable. Things like supporting the UK's world leading research. But over and above that economic element of their contribution, international students bring a myriad of benefits to the UK. They provide an invaluable multicultural university experience for our UK students, helping to prepare them for an international workplace, but also bringing a diverse perspective to their studies and helping them to make friends from all over the world. They also ensure the viability of strategically important courses in areas like engineering, where they make up 60% of all of the postgraduate or that's master's students, and even more in some more specific disciplines within that. And they contribute positively to their local area by things like volunteering, but also by bringing cultural diversity to the arts, to the local festivals, and to local restaurants and cuisine. And when international students graduate, they have the potential as well to form a really vital skills base for the UK. We know that where they are able to stay, they go into areas like healthcare, where they provide useful and invaluable nurses and doctors. They go into areas like financial analysis, software development, or providing the academics of the future. Janet's important research in her, this report outlines recent trends in international student mobility to the UK and also highlights five little known facts, as the title says, but some potential pitfalls for the UK. I'll let her to present her research now, and then after that's finished, we'll take some questions from the audience. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, before I go into the five facts, I shall very briefly set the context in which these facts have to be treated. And um, what we have here is two charts. The first one shows undergraduate entry into UK higher education, and the second one is postgraduate entry. Uh, by entry, we only mean the new enrollments into UK higher education. So the green bar chart shows non-EU students and the blue bar shows EU students. I think, I think that um, at an undergraduate level, 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 it's important, important to bear in mind that uh, the tuition fee increases in 2012 led to a significant decline in EU student numbers. And it has taken the UK almost five years to recover to the levels of 2011, 2010-11, which is 2011-12, which is the year before the tuition fees were introduced. The non-EU students, both at um, undergraduate and postgraduate level, uh, picked up in 2013-14, and since then they have plateaued, or there has been a slight decline. It is uh, important to bear in mind that at postgraduate level, student numbers were actually plateauing uh, before then. The, the plateauing started in 2010-11, which allows for lag effects of the global financial crisis, which um, I think mainly affected postgraduate demand from countries like India, 
where remittances generated in the advanced economies would have affected privately funded demand. The UK was not the only country that was affected. Uh, Indian students going to the US have also experienced significant declines. So with this in mind, I shall go straight into the uh, by fast. Fast one. One. More than half of the UK's international students are new entrants. Uh, 54% uh, of the student population in the UK are new enrollments. The significance of this fact is that um, how more than half of the student body has to be replenished on an annual basis. It indicates the importance of the marketing effort that universities have to continuously maintain to recruit new students, but it also shows the importance of streamlined admissions and immigration to the UK. If any of those changes, uh, such as, for example, the perceived ease of the student visa, it means that more than half of the student population would be affected. This compares with other countries, for example, it would definitely take with Germany or the US, it would take more than uh, possibly uh, more than a year, at least two years, for them to have a similar impact as the one in the UK, but in the UK, the impact is likely to be felt on the first year of the introduced changes. Moving on, on to a fact two. Uh, uh, this fact is very much inspired by University of UK last year's report on international student trends, uh, where it was highlighted that the UK has the largest postgraduate sector, with the second largest to the US only. So while the UK postgraduate sector is half the size of the US, its annual international student intake is higher. This is mainly attributed to significantly shorter postgraduate degrees. The UK's master's course is usually one year compared to the US, where on average it would take at least two years. But it also again highlights the importance of what has just been mentioned. Uh, streamlined admissions, streamlined visas and attractive um, offer for international students is of a paramount importance. But it has to be treated in the context that the numbers peaked in 2013-14 and they have plateaued or they have been a slightly slow gradual decline in international entry to the UK ever since. Moving on to fact three, uh, it's um, there is a very strong positive relationship between growth in international enrollments and post-study work opportunities. This compares the UK with uh, some of the UK peer groups such as uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, Ireland, New Zealand and the USA. We can see the double digit growth or the competitive peer group and the difference between this country and the US is uh, significantly uh, better post-study work opportunities that are present elsewhere but uh, currently not available or very limited in the UK. Uh, another significant difference is uh, of course the presence of the international student recruitment targets that uh, the peer group has and as such the package of uh, student visa and post-study work opportunities complements the higher education offer of these countries. Fact four is um, a continuation of um, what Eleanor uh, mentioned earlier, why postgraduate researchers are so important to the UK knowledge base, UK economy and UK higher education. However, what is a rather warning trend there is that uh, at postgraduate research level, uh, what we have is the major sources of tuition fees, such as um, uh, privately funded students, which is the top green line, uh, followed by overseas sources. Um, the major one there is obviously core ships. They all have been in decline over the past two to three years. The only source of funding that continues to increase is um, tuition fee waivers. 
The implication of this finding is that universities absorb the tuition fee costs of the students simply because there is a need for the higher education to accept to researchers coming to the UK to do postgraduate research. I have to mention that the chart is based on postgraduate research entrance. And the final fact signifies the importance of uh, transnational education to the UK. It's, um, I believe, uh, perhaps the most known fact about UK higher education. And there uh, are more, uh, more students studying towards UK degrees overseas than there are students coming to the UK to study. I think overall 61% of the students doing UK degrees are based offshore. Uh, why is transnational education important uh, for the UK higher education? Uh, there are quite a few strong reasons. Uh, previous research has shown that um, a significant proportion of the TNE students articulate in the UK higher education and they uh, either through top-up degrees or through other uh, routes, they continue and they finish their education in the UK. Uh, uh, a research carried out previously, previously by the Higher Education Funding Council for England found that a third of the uh, undergraduate entrants into bachelor's programmes have actually articulated in, the, in England from the courses that delivered to show. show. Another reason uh, about the importance of TNE is that uh, it maintains a um, global footprint of UK higher education, especially in countries with very little mobility to UK, such as um, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Trinidad, and other countries. Uh, Oman is an important one where almost 20,000 students do TNE degree, however, only a smaller number of students come to the UK to study uh, full time. And uh, the third important reason uh, for the T UK TNE is that uh, it uh, has maintained the relevance of the UK higher education offer in places where students' flows are heading elsewhere. An example of that is Malaysia and United Arab Emirates that have become emerging hotspots for international students within their local region. The UAE, for example, hosts more students from the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa region, than the UK or Australia. However, TNE degrees delivered in the UAE are particularly popular with students that wouldn't necessarily travel to the UK. And thank you. And um, if I'm to summarize uh, the five uh, facts that um, have been highlighted so far, there is um, a very strong relationship between government policies and international student flows. I think that um, this has, has to, to be treated in the context that uh, government policies, uh, to a degree, play a much more important role than um, exchange rates, rates and, and other, other external, external changes, changes in the macroeconomic context uh, compared with regard to international student flows. And uh, as such, it has, has to be, be basically treated in the context or in relationship, relationship to what other countries and other governments are doing to attract uh, the international students to their own higher education systems. Another one is the importance of sustaining international demand for UK education, but equally to work with overseas funders. Uh, perhaps one of the less known uh, facts about postgraduate uh, study in the UK is that over the past few years, the UK has very much attracted or become dependent on funded scholars, government funded scholars such as um, uh, schools from Brazil, Saudi Arabia, um, Malaysia was a strong country in terms of uh, government funding, but also Iraq and when government funds are affected, um, the number of scholars choosing uh, traveling to the UK is uh, diminishing for obvious reasons. Uh, as such, relying on self-funded students becomes increasingly important. I will draw, draw on a report which was produced by the British Council last year and uh, 
uh, highlight uh, some of the uh, he, he, some countries that are likely to seek international uh, education in future, such as China, India, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Pakistan. Out of this country, China is the only one that students continue to come to study in the UK. The other four, we have seen significant declines in demand, such as India, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. As such, much more needs to be done to attract self funded students from these countries in particular. I have already highlighted the importance of transnational education and all of the above requires an alignment among key higher education stakeholders such as individual higher education institutions, national agencies and government departments working together, translating the same message of welcome to international students. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. That was a really interesting presentation. I think really highlights some of the things which we need to know so that we can make policy suggestions and we can try and make the UK a more attractive destination for international students and maybe try and reverse that stagnation sort of plateauing that we've seen in recent years. Sometimes we hear um, that TNE transnational education is a good replacement for having international students on shore. I think you've spoken a bit already about why that isn't necessarily the case and how the two are complementary. I wonder mm. if you could just say a bit more about that. Um, yes, I've, I've always maintained that um, the UK higher education is um, it's a global offer and, and so um, it's a, as a global offer uh, it attracts uh, students from all over the world and trying to box it or trying to constrain it doesn't do the higher education in the UK any, any favours or any justice. I also think that um, it also speaks to different audiences some audiences, as I mentioned earlier, would not necessarily travel to the UK to study, as yeah, such as students from Zimbabwe or students from Trinidad or students from Oman. Uh, however, UK TNE has managed to reach communities at areas that um, UK universities would not necessarily engage with. However, however, having said all that, um, it's also equally important to bear in mind that there will always be students who are willing to travel for their international studies. Uh, uh, analysis of uh, UNESCO Institute of Statistics data shows that over the past 40 years, 2% of the student population travels um, outside their home country to seek international education. And that will continue to be the case until the UK closes its doors. All it's going to cause is displacement from students um, that would just go elsewhere for their studies. So I think it's fair to say that uh, if a government policy changes and when the country shuts its doors for international students, it will not stop mobility, it will simply displace students and send them elsewhere. And when we know that the number of students looking to study in general is rising, that 2% becomes more important and a much higher number each year, I guess, Absolutely. as well. And there's also the difficulty, of course, if we're thinking in purely economic terms, you know, the government sometimes does, and um, that TNE has much less of an impact on the UK's economy and so education exports. Mm. And uh, it's also, I guess, uh, really important to be mindful that um, transnational education is mainly to engage overseas and to impact other countries' development uh, agendas. I think an excellent example of how the K2 or the 2K is doing internationally is that that's perhaps exemplified by programs uh, um, initiated by the Thai government, by the Philippines government, where UK institutions are invited to collaboratively engage and deliver uh, subject provision in very niche areas that are deemed to be of national importance for these countries. But at the moment, Thailand and the Philippines, for example, have very little or no provision there at all. As such, it's important, but it's perhaps more important to the local development agendas overseas than the actual UK agenda. Yeah, and of course, it's not going to be a solution for every university. It's not going to be something which every university can get involved in. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly it. 
Yes. Great. And um, well, we can carry on. And um, so another thing I was wondering about is your back number four, four faces on oh. postgraduate research students and why it's so important that we're able to continue to increase numbers there. What do you think that postgraduate research students in particular bring to the UK? I think that uh, postgraduate, international postgraduate students make a significant contribution to the UK uh, knowledge base. Uh, we know that um, they're very important ambassadors uh, for the UK research and UK education when they return home. We know that more than half of the research output is generated collaboratively with uh, overseas uh, co-authors and many of those co-authors are likely to have been educated in the UK or to have some experience of UK higher education. Um, a research, again, that was published by the Higher Education Funding Council, which shows that early career researchers, more than 40 percent of the early career researchers, uh, come from outside the UK, which shows that um, uh, international researchers are a very important pathway into academic career. Uh, in the UK. And we know that talent knows no borders. If an institution or a company is to recruit the best talent, they will not necessarily look into where the talent comes from. It's a, it's a, a, global, um, it's a global good as such. Um, it's really artificial trying to constrain it to only recruiting talent within the UK borders. Really. We've had a question through from the audience, which is, will, will we be sharing the presentation in the hall? We will be sharing the presentation. We'll also be putting this webinar up on YouTube. And the report's currently available from our website. So please do go and download it. Um, it's a really interesting report and there's a lot of reading. I think there's a lot to um, pick out from there and a lot of really useful information. Are there any further questions from the audience? If anyone would like to send any through, please do, and we will follow those up. And uh, I guess it's um, perhaps um, uh, important to bear in mind that uh, some of the truth that, um, or some of the facts that I've mentioned, they're probably, some of them are quite uh, well known to. Uh, UK audiences, but uh, I think it's really important the context into which uh, they are treated. Uh, for example, the sheer fact that the UK um, has higher annual intake of postgraduate students compared to the US should not be taken as, oh wow, UK equals too many. It's, um, it's the, the idiosyncrasy of UK higher education is basically depends on continuous flaws of yeah. international students just to maintain the current base of students in the country. Uh, as such, I would say, it's a very efficient sector. It's really new. Uh, students come to the UK, they finish their degree, and then they move on. But uh, compared to other countries, they're in the UK for significantly shorter durations of time compared to the time they spent elsewhere. And also, uh, I guess, UK higher education is catering to students' needs and enabling them to basically articulate from overseas institution or a UK school to limit overseas straight into the UK programme. And um, I think one of the advantages that um, uh, enabling this flexible mode of delivery um, has equipped students with is that um, uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds are able to still acquire UK degree for a significantly shorter period of time than uh, they would be doing if they were based uh, elsewhere, yeah. which is a credit to the flexibility that the uh, UK system is offering or UK higher education institutions are offering. And it also offers us an opportunity, I guess, because it means that it will, when we do have the kind of policy changes that we're looking for to change that environment, things may be able to turn around more quickly than they would otherwise be able to do in another country. 
Uh, absolutely. We have more than half of the students that are new entrants. So any policy change is likely to be multiplied or it's likely to be felt instantaneously across the whole the whole system. But it's really important to bear in mind to be operating in a very competitive environment. And other countries already are doing uh, well beyond what the UK is currently offering. Which brings us neatly onto our next um, question from the audience, which is, are there any particular examples of great things that our competitors are doing around international student recruitment, supporting international student mobility, which we could learn from? Ah. <laughs> Um, uh, I think that uh, there is um, well, a uh, wealth of um, examples, uh, especially around uh, postgraduate researchers. Uh, many of the countries uh, across the world are well aware about the importance of talent to go into their countries. And uh, as such, we have countries such as um, France, for example, where the tuition to the waivers of postgraduate researchers are going to do their PhDs in France. Um, Canada uh, has a devolved, um, uh, is a devolved nation. Different provinces have their own uh, immigration policies, but uh, I think what Canada has been very successful in is um, streamlining their student visa to particular regions that the country needs to be of national importance to Canada. And in certain areas, the tuition fees uh, of the students are used as. Um, uh, when the students graduate and start working in Canada, they are basically reducing their tax that uh, they owed when they start earning. So any tuition fee contribution in Canada in particular provinces are used to reduce their tax when they start earning. Uh, I think that if one looks for examples what others are doing, there is a wealth of um, practice and wealth of examples of um, how international students are treated. Perhaps, in, in my opinion, what comes to mind is uh, um, in, in, in the UK, students are treated as immigrants and they're part of the net migration packets. In many countries, they're treated as talent. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a different tone of voice, a different rhetoric. And yeah. if one is treated as talent, it's a kind of it's conducive to a different attitude to the students. And I think what's interesting in your table as well as the study work opportunities, you've highlighted having an international student's target and campaign to grow international student numbers in some of our competitors. One of the other questions we've had from the audience is um, what policy changes the UK, the universities UK asking for from the government? And then one of the things that we're definitely focusing on is having an international student strategy and sort of a cross-governmental, cross-departmental strategy to increase international student numbers and policy around international student numbers so that we're bringing together things like the Department for International Trade with the Department for Education and with the Home Office to ensure that all of our policies are conducive to welcoming international students and making them feel that the UK is a destination that they're welcome in. Um, we've also been asked how we will be presenting this data in order to influence government policy. And I think one of the big things that we've been doing is working with those departments to try and develop an international student strategy. That's something which we're getting quite good buy-in on now and we hope will be going forward. But we're also developing um, a new proposal around post-study work, which we're hoping to launch at some point um, in the next couple of months. So that's something to keep an eye on, which hopefully will be beneficial for the sector and well supported within the sector. Let me just see if we need to have any other questions through. So we've had a question through about um, financial analysis of the benefits of DNE, whether that's per student per year or how the income compares with the income from UK based international students. We know from um, recent Department for Education statistics that TNE does contribute to all of the education exports, but it's a tiny proportion of um, what we get in terms of onshore recruitment, partly obviously because people aren't based here, so they're not spending money here, but also, as you say, the cost to the students is lower 
I think if you're if that's something you're particularly interested in, I'd recommend the Department of Education's export education export figures. We're expecting figures for the twenty, I think, sixteen, seventeen year to come out shortly. So do keep an eye out for those. I think they're coming out next month. Um, but we've got figures for previous years, which were released earlier this year and last year. Our own education exports um, figures also cover TNE um, in some detail. So, so I can recommend, recommend having a look at those uh, from last year, but they're still very useful and definitely something which we make quite a lot of use of in our campaigning. And if I can also uh, add to that, is that uh, I think it's um, uh, probably trying to separate the TNE from the onshore. It's um, not particularly helpful, bearing in mind how many of the transnational education students articulate into yeah. the UK onto onshore education. And this is particularly valid for students from China, students from Malaysia. Um, as such, TNE overseas may not generate as um, much income for the UK higher education sector, but students' articulations do generate uh, this income. Uh, again, I uh, visited the University of the UK, I think, a couple of years ago, about the scale of work of the UK transnational education. Uh, I highlighted that online degrees is one of the key um, earners uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, revenues for the institution uh, where I think online degrees cost more or less the same as, as students coming to the UK to study. So within the TNE, I think there are very differentiated types of delivery. Some of them are earning more, some of them are um, earning yes. less. Um, um, so however, it has to be taken into the, the context of the wider benefits that the TNE brings to the institution and the long term engagement that uh, it is into the country of operation. And um, I guess uh, one of the uh, shortcomings, or uh, one of the um, aspects to always watch out for is that transnational education is there for the long term. And one has to bear in mind it's a long term game. Uh, and hence, uh, short term returns are really difficult to keep. Um, the real benefits of come in the midst to, to the long term. Yeah. One of the things, and um, going back to the very beginning of your presentation, that's really interesting, I think, is um, that it's taken so long to recover from the change in tuition fees for mm -hmm. EU students since 2012-13. Why do you think it took such a long time? Because we've seen quite good growth mm -hmm. in sort of 2015-16. It's um. It's very interesting. I think recovery always takes much longer than uh, than, than we think. Uh, initially, many of the students, that, um, and probably the same goes true. true for the UK students, students uh, many, many of the students that would have deferred um, in 2011, they came, they yeah. took out their studies in 2011 because the situation was still at the previous levels. So 2011 had a little bit of a peak which meant less students going into 2012 uh, to study. But then in 2012, whoever could have deferred, they deferred to come into later, basically not knowing exactly what will happen down the tuition phase, um, etc. So building reputation, I think, takes always much, much longer than um, Having an instantaneous shock of a change, of a policy change, and I think the same is absolutely true. For example, when the immigration changes in the US happened following the September 11th events, um, when there was a reversal of the visa policy, students didn't come straight away. It took years to, you know, to build a reputation, to build a brand, and the trust of the students. Hence, with any policy change, it's always worth remembering that um, recovery takes longer. Yeah. It's not instantaneous. But Australia has been quite successful in having that recovery from 2013 mm -hmm. onwards with the Knight Review. Do you think there's anything that we can learn from the way they approached reversing yeah. that trend in international students? I think I absolutely agree. I think Australia has provided a phenomenal example um, about uh, a balancing that, but they've also taken a while 
to uncover so the uh, similar to the UK Australia immigration system uh, basically tightened up in 2010 uh, shortly after the global financial crisis where local market shortfalls and uh, a rising unemployment basically blamed on immigration so in a response to that uh, the immigration falls down but what Australia has, and is still a significant advantage to the country, is that education exports are part of their national statistics. So the Australian Bureau for Statistics basically started uh, accounting every year, or the publication is every year, about uh, the declines in the export values of international students. And it was obvious to policymakers and to everybody the a huge damage done to the country by the sheer fact that less students were going to Australia for their education. Yeah. Hence, the nice review and they made for the recommendations uh, that were put forward that were accepted by the government, I think, in the year that the review was made in 2012. But it still took Australia a significant, you know, quite a few years to to build trust in countries like India and to reverse the decline in student numbers. And I remember going to one of the Australian conferences where um, the education minister was very grateful to the UK because the UK policy basically facilitated a quick recovery of Australia in terms of student number declines, uh, which kind of resonated with people in the audience, I think, especially the UK delegates to the conference. Yeah. So potentially, if we do things in the right way, we may be able to benefit from immigration policies in the US. If we're lucky. <laughs> we'll see. Um, thank you, Janet. That's been a really Thanks, interesting yes. presentation, a really interesting session. Thank you to the audience as well. We've had some really interesting questions. And I hope that's been really useful for you and we've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Goodbye. Thank you.